Index funds have made investing much, much simpler, offering anyone access to the whole stock market with little effort. And since most actively managed funds aren't able to beat the market, the total stock market and the S&P 500 have become the unbeatable benchmark that is guaranteed to give you phenomenal returns in the long term. There is another way, though, that historically delivers better returns, and this is going to be the content of this video. Let's keep it a secret, okay? Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm Rick, and this channel is the right place for you if you're interested in funds and investing. If you know me and my channel, you know I'm all about ETFs and index fund investing. And in fact, just last week, I published a complete guide to index fund investing. Nevertheless, in this video, I'm going to introduce you to a strategy called factory investing, which takes it a step further by entering areas of the market that are known for producing higher returns. There are also going to be some downsides, but don't worry, everything will be clear for you after this video. So let's get into it. Let's get back in time to the 60s. I want you to meet William F. Sharp, an economist and professor of finance who in 1964 developed the Capital Asset Pricing Model, or CAPM. This model established that if an investor wanted to achieve a higher return than the market, they needed to take on more risk than the market. I know it sounds obvious to you now, but follow me here. The inherent risk of the market was defined as beta and assigned a value of 1. So for example, a market cap weighted index fund like the S&P 500 would have a beta of 1, whereas a portfolio of 50% stocks and 50% cash might have a beta of 0.5, and a portfolio of highly risky stocks might have a beta of 1.5. Beta is there to tell us how risky the portfolio is compared to the market. So if the market went up by 10% in value, we would expect the low beta portfolio to rise by 5%, and a high beta portfolio to rise by 15. And in the opposite direction, if the market loses 10%, we would expect the same ratio with negative returns on the other portfolios. Sharp's discovery made clear that the main reason why some fund managers outperform others was not actually due to incredible skills in stock picking, but simply because they were taking on more risk. Just like if you have a portfolio of only cryptocurrencies and there's a bull run, you're gonna have extremely good results, not because you picked better position than the S&P 500, but because you took on more risk. But investing can just be all about taking more or less risk. Think about investors like Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, Bill Ackman, that managed to have higher returns than a stock market in the long term without necessarily adding additional risk. So to measure that, alpha was introduced. And since decades, economists have been studying which factors influence alpha and allow some skilled investors to achieve higher returns than others in the long term. What was discovered was that these higher performing portfolios tended to have higher allocation to companies with certain characteristics, namely smaller companies and value stock companies that have low valuation compared to the fundamentals. Now, if it's true that some section of the market, like value, or small cap are actually able to deliver high returns without additional risk, this must mean that they are somehow undervalued. So in 1992, a model based on the CAPM was developed by Eugene Fama and Kenneth French, suggesting that small cap and value stocks were actually exposed to a risk that was entirely independent from the market risk and that they were also independent drivers of return. This model was able to demonstrate that roughly two-thirds of the alpha generated by these fund managers could be explained by them simply having a higher exposure to smaller companies and value stocks. In the US, since 1971, small cap value stocks have delivered a return that is over four times larger than large cap growth stocks, delivering an average yearly return of 13.91% against 10.72% of large cap growth. But if you invest in a total stock market through something like VTI, or in the S&P 500 through something like VOO, you're actually investing in a market cap weighted index fund, namely a fund in which the weight of each single holding depend on how big its market capitalization is. So you're basically leaving the additional performance of small companies off the table. And you might even have less weight on value than growth. So since Farmer and French's three-factor model that included market, size, and value, other factors have now been discovered that explain the drivers of stock market returns. One is momentum, namely stocks that have performed well recently tend to continue to do so. Then we have low volatility, where we find that less volatile stocks tend to produce higher risk-adjusted returns than more volatile stocks. And more recently, profitability, which is gonna sound obvious to you because it tells us that more profitable companies produce higher returns than less profitable ones. All these factors play their role into optimizing our returns. But obviously, investing is not like math. So you can expect these factors to outperform all the time. A low volatile stock, for example, is gonna tendentially give you a higher risk-adjusted 
performance, but it can also lose more than a recent one. A stock that has momentum can have a longer and higher growth, but can also go down the drain if it was too overvalued. So what's more interesting is actually seeing how these factors interact with each other. This table shows the results from 2000 to 2022 of different segments of the American stock market. You can see that the best result is achieved with small cap value, even compared to small cap and value taken separately. This other table here from Standard & Poor's shows US stock market data between 1990 and 2011, comparing various single factor strategies with the S&P 500. You can notice that over this period, each of these factor strategies individually outperformed the S&P 500, both of an absolute basis, and when adjusting for risk through the sharp ratio. But the best result is achieved if we combine these four strategies together into a single portfolio. Not only does it outperform the market, but we would have done so with less risk. And this happens because these factors are not correlated with each other. So when one is underperforming, the other one is not. So diversifying by considering all these factors allows you to smooth out bad results from a factor with good results with another. And since all of these factors individually perform better than the market, if taken together, they're going to increase the overall performance even more. Over the last 10-15 years, asset managers like Vanguard and BlackRock have been creating so-called smart beta funds, which might sound like a very complicated term, but in the end, smart beta is nothing more than a catch-all term for strategies that aim to deliver better risk-adjusted returns than traditional market cap-weighted indexes. They're usually a blend of passive and active investing that adjust their holdings based on factors such as size, value, momentum, and volatility. For example, the Vanguard Value Index Fund ETF, VTV, can be considered a smart beta fund or a factor fund focus on the factor of value. The Invesco S&P 500 Low Volatility ETF, ticker SPLV, is a fund that factors on low volatility. The Invesco S&P 500 Quality ETF, SPHQ, is a fundamental ETF based on quality, and the iShares MSCA USA Momentum Factor ETF, MTUM, focuses on momentum. But the interesting thing is that there are also smart beta ETFs that combines multiple factors. For example, one of my favorites is VBR, the Vanguard Small Cap Value ETF, that combines the two factors, small cap and value, in one single ETF, and this with a cheap expense ratio of 0.07%. If you look at the returns since 2004, you're gonna find a slightly lower return than the S&P 500. And this is because from 2010 to today, growth and large cap have been dominating the market. But if you are a good investor and if you want to invest for the long term, you need to be able to consider much longer time horizons for investment decisions and not only be blinded by the results of the last 10 years. You're going to see, for example, that mid cap and small cap have strongly outperformed large cap in the last 50 years, as well as in shorter time horizons like from 1994 to today. You're also going to see that value performed better than growth in the last 100 years, for which value has grown almost 20 times more than growth. And that since 1979 to 2020, value and growth have taken turns outperforming and underperforming every decade. In the last decade, growth was victorious. So who knows what's really gonna happen in the next decade. Now, there are different problems with factor investing that makes us wonder if it's really worth it to invest in it, or instead, it's better to trust the good old total stock market. One problem is obviously complexity, because you're gonna have to add more ETFs to your portfolio, which brings problems like overlap, possibly higher expense ratios, and also simply more ETFs to deal with. Another problem is uncertainty. We're living in market conditions that have not existed for a very long time. The inflation rate, while falling, is likely to remain above central bank's targets until the end of 2024. The Federal Reserve is unlikely to rush into cutting rates so fast this year, and from a macroeconomic and geopolitical standpoint, the world is becoming more complex and changing. And the third problem is that even using this strategy, you will underperform at times. When it comes to these long-term trends, you might have to go through 10 long years of bad performance, which not many people are able to bear. This table shows you US stock market data between 1927 and 2011. It looks at how often these factors have delivered positive premiums over different time periods. In the first column, we can see that the market has delivered a positive premium in 88 of five-year periods, which means that investing in a market cap weighted index fund beats investing in US treasury bills 88% of the time. Smaller companies beat large companies 71% of the time. Value 
value has speed and growth 76% of the time and momentum 94% of the time. And this obviously sounds good, but it also shows that there is still a probability of seeing five or even 10 year periods where these factors will underperform. And it's exactly what happened over the last decade with small cap and value. So should you use factor investing or should you invest in market capitalized large cap index funds like the S&P 500? My suggestion lies in the middle. If you're gonna embark 100% on a strategy like factor investing, you need to be ready to have a more complex portfolio and for sure, you will underperform at times and unless you have an extremely high conviction, it's gonna be hard to stick to it. So this is a possible strategy that lies in the middle. I would personally be more confident that I'm gonna be able to hold a portfolio in the long term if it's most made of simple large cap stocks like the S&P 500. But this doesn't mean that you can strategically lean on value, for example, through good value ETFs like VTV, the Vanguard value ETF, or some dividend ETFs like SHD or VYM. And nothing stops you from having most of your weight in the total stock market or in the S&P 500, but testing also small cap as a separate ETF. For example, through the iShares Core S&P Small Cap ETF, IJR. Or even better, through a value small cap ETF like the Vanguard Small Cap Value ETF, VBR. I hope this video was interesting for you. If it was, you are very welcome to subscribe to the channel because I'm sure you're gonna find many other interesting videos here and also gonna be notified for future videos by clicking the ring bell. Thank you so much for watching until the end. I wish you a great day or evening and as always, I'll see you in the next video. Ciao!